Thank you, Selena. Thank you for uh, doing a recap again. Uh, we do have a question, uh, and uh, it relates to the comments. Uh, the question from Patricia Anderson says, in your webinar you talked about linking survey results directly to the comments because people tend to add comments about the questions they have been asked. How do you link the comments with the survey answers? That's a great question, Patricia. Um, I link them actually in the NVivo database. Now, one thing you'll note when you look at your qualitative and quantitative data is that both of them have the same field of ID, respondent ID. And these are unique ID numbers that have been assigned to the respondent when they've, joined, when they've provided their responses to LibQuel. NVivo, um, so I'm sure most of the others are the same, but the NVivo qualitative database allows you to tie those two things together. So I'll have my qualitative coded data in my NVivo, and I add the quantitative, have I got the right way around, qualitative, quantitative, <laughs> quantitative data linked on the respondent ID field within NVivo. And then I can start to run some heavy querying using that as a um, classifying field. So it automatically classifies my qualitative comments by the, the scores that they've given in every single question in Lib LibQuel. So it becomes an incredibly powerful tool. Thank you. Uh, someone uh, wanted the name of the uh, program you're using. I've just put it on the chat uh, box in vivo. And there are, that's just one of a handful. Um, yeah. Yeah, Brenda, uh, Brenda, I can see your question. It's NVivo, N V I V O. Um, it used to be called Nudist, but until Google came along, they realized they needed to change the name of it because people couldn't search for it. Um, the, um, the other systems on the market include Atlas TI, and there's another couple of other ones as well. I'm fairly sure they work fairly similar. Um, I can see Leona um, is asking the, actually the technical how. You know, it's actually quite challenging to do this. So if I, if I could, I'll take that um, question offline, and I'll send that as an email um, through to people afterwards if they're very interested. But basically, it's a case of you input in your qualitative data as your external data as you would normally do in an Excel file. And then when you're in there, you can add it in as a classifying sheet. Um, and a classification sheet, you can add in your, your LibQuel raw data from, from Excel as a classifying sheet. And that's generally how it is. Um, if that's okay with you, Leanna, I'll add on any further um, details if people want to. I can type that up and email it around. We have a few more questions coming in. Fran uh, Scott asks, how specifically do you thank and give feedback to your customers immediately after closing the survey? Uh, thanks for that, Fran. Uh, we use a combination of a web-based um, uh, news item on our library website, and also we add a news item to our uh, in-house university magazine. We don't actually have a student magazine, which would be nice if we had some forum like that. And I think these days moving towards the Facebook side of things to say thank you to people, there are a lot more opportunities than what we actually do. Obviously, we can't go back to the actual individuals to say thank you for this question. Um, but we can actually go around and say generally this is a comment you've given us and this is generally what we're going to do in response to that. It's not an individual personalized message, which would be nice to do, but we can't do that because of data confidentiality, obviously. This reminds me, Selena, that um, we are, we are uh, working here with a couple of libraries uh, trying to test a confidential version of the protocol in this coming oh. year. Uh, so we'll keep the community informed about how that goes. Um, a very good question coming from Lauren, uh, where she highlights um, uh, 
the fact that you pointed out in your presentation that you work with department heads to customize the survey questions, to select optional questions that are relevant to them. How has this customization impacted your longitudinal analysis, uh, you know, when questions are removed one year and reinserted other years? Uh, what has been the pattern of selecting the optional questions? Yeah, that's been a great question, Lauren. Actually, we haven't changed too much, to be honest. Our optional questions are fairly standard, and there's three or four that we've used every single year, one of which being the main text and readings I need for my work. Um, that was actually developed as a scholar question in 2003, and we've used it annually since then because it's a key strategic issue for us. Another one is the opening hours question, which is an optional question, and we've, again, used that every single year. In the main, we tend not to swap out the optional questions too much unless there's a real business need. And we did swap over a few others this year because slight shifts in our strategic alignment. So, for example, this year, for the first time, we had the career section is now part of the library services. And so we did swap out one of the optional questions and introduced a optional question asking about careers provision within the library. And that's due to our political changes. So there are chances to look at it from a strategic point of view, to think what's actually very important to us, but also try not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, if you like, and keeping the optional questions as static as we feasibly can to keep that longitudinal analysis. And this is a very good question uh, for for the standard questions as well, because you know they have been grounded. There was a lot of research done. They are still relevant, but at the same time, we are uh, trying to think what would be the next uh, approach uh, and how would we engage in uh, in trying to capture some of the new emerging areas. Um, the questions have been standard for ten years now since you know, 2003, and I know you've done a little bit of work on that in that area, Selena, too. I believe you yeah. have a paper, right? Yeah, I did a paper in 20, uh, 2011 now where we tried to have a look at the um, what, are, what still matters to our customers, and we actually looked to reground the LibCol data. Um, and I've worked with a variety of different customer groups at Cranfield to go through what matters to them and what they expect from the library service. And actually, we were pleasantly surprised to find that the things that uh, are in the LibCorp survey still matter to our customer base, and they were still asking for the same things. So we didn't feel that there was a massive need then to completely review everything about the LibCorp survey, and we thought that the instrument was still valid for us going forward. Thank you. We are going to take one last question that uh, we sort of answered it. It came earlier by email. Eileen Theodore Schuster uh, sent us an email um, about the personalized emails uh, that you you sent and how you went about doing the mail merge. Yes, I used, as I mentioned in my presentation, a combination of an Excel spreadsheet with our customers. Uh, Christian name on there, um, is it Christian? Oh, sorry, first name on there, and also last name on there, and their email address, and also gave me their subject discipline and their position category. Um, I used Word to mail merge that using email. The only thing with that I would say is that it does put through a large amount of email traffic onto your servers, and so you will need some permission from your IT department if you are going to take this approach. I only have a small number of customers, and so it wasn't too tra too heavy on our traffic. But I would suggest that you consider that carefully before you start <laughs> clogging up all of your mail servers, sending individual emails to everybody on campus. I can see my, my good friend Norman Boyd has uh, given us a great feedback here about some of the things that he's been doing. And he's been using the largest um, coded category of positive comments about his library staff in an advent calendar type email to all library staff to tell them how wonderful they are. Norman, that's a great tip. I love that. So uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Selena. It's been wonderful to have you and to capture this uh, experience with two webcasts. Uh, the part one that was uh, pre-recorded and the part two that was the live one. Any departing words? 
Uh, only that I've absolutely loved my last 12 years working with LibCorp. It's been utterly fascinating, and my customers never, ever cease to amaze me. Um, it's been utterly joyous. And for those of you who are carrying on with your LibCorp journeys, enjoy every moment. It's hilarious some days, and you never know what you're going to get from them. <laughs> Thank you, Selena. And we will try to see if we can figure out a version of it that would uh, fit the open university reality. Only online. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Martha. And it's been great working with you all. If any of those people who are listening to me now, of my friends and colleagues, or I've met at the various library assessment conferences or LibCorp events over the years, I wish you all well and love and luck going forward. Take care, folks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.